what a what a treat to be with you today um, and how appropriate to be having this rally today in the city known to be the cradle of liberty for our entire nation um, and Philadelphia of course was still the nation's capital city when the First Amendment to the Constitution was adopted. And it is that First Amendment to the Constitution that brings us together here today. Um, I want to tell you a quick story. When my eight-year-old son asked me several months ago, Mom, what are you working on? I briefly explained the issue. You know, the government isn't, isn't respecting our religious freedom. I'm kind of thinking, how on earth do you explain the HHS mandate to an eight-year-old? Well, to my surprise, he said in his cute, gruff, little eight-year-old boy voice, Mom, isn't that why the pilgrims left England? To come to America? <laughs> so yes, even a second grader can understand that we are fortunate enough, blessed enough, to be living in a country where the First Amendment guarantees our right to religious liberty. In a country that was literally founded upon religious liberty as our first right. So what's going on? Why are we here today? Why aren't we at our kids' soccer games today? Or out in the backyard cleaning up leaves from the storm? Or watching a football game and TV in our cozy family rooms with our feet up? Notre Dame's playing Pittsburgh today. <laughs> well, we're here because of a very disturbing pattern coming from the Obama administration. There always used to be a bipartisan consensus on the issue of religious liberty. It used to be a bit of a sacred cow, respected by Democrats and Republicans alike. You know, when Bill Clinton proposed his health care bill, he included broad conscience protections for Catholic hospitals and people of faith. These were endorsed by people like Senator Ted Kennedy, the liberal lion of the United States Senate, even supported by then-Senator Joe Biden. But then, along came the Obama administration. Four years ago, candidate Obama promised to bring the country together, promised to unite us, but instead, he chose to impose a very divisive policy. He has chosen to pick a fight with people of faith. Now, one might have thought he would have focused on jobs, the economy, maybe the $16 trillion debt. But no, he chose to shatter the bipartisan consensus that had always existed on conscience rights and religious liberty. And not only did the Obama administration say to religious charities, Catholic schools, Catholic hospitals, Christian colleges, not only did he say, you must give away for free contraception, abortion-inducing drugs, and sterilization as part of your health care plan. Not only did he say, you must provide these products, even if they conflict with the teachings of your faith, but in addition to that, the government is going to fine you impose harsh financial penalties if you don't comply. Now this, folks, is extreme. President Obama has gone too far. Catholic Charities of Chicago serves over a million people in need every year. They're facing $5 million in fines per year. Catholic Charities of Washington, D.C., they estimate $1.6 million in fines simply for serving the poor. Sadly, as I'm sure you're aware, and we heard earlier from Lori Windham of the Beckett Fund, many of these charities have been forced to sue the federal government to protect their freedoms. Let's look at some of the lesser known charities, some here in Pennsylvania that still haven't had their day in court, but they have sued the Obama administration. They're waiting their day in court. And let's look at how they line up with our mission as people of faith to serve the least among us, to perform the corporal works of mercy. Many of these religious organizations that I'm about to mention sought exemption from the mandate, but they were denied because they did not qualify as religious under the Obama administration's definition because they serve all those in need, not just Catholics. So let's take a look at a few of these charities. St. Martin Center of Erie, Pennsylvania has an emergency food program, a food pantry, a free breakfast that they offer. 
They fulfilled the corporal work of mercy to feed the hungry, suing the Obama administration. The Archdiocese of Washington's Global Village Program that according to their literature puts water in cups and hope in hearts. They give drink to the thirsty. The Prince of Peace Center of Farrell, Pennsylvania is a thrift store. It provides clothing and other essential items to those in need at low cost or for free. If the thrift store makes any monies, it recycles it back into its charitable endeavors. They are literally clothing the naked of Farrell, Pennsylvania. Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York has emergency shelters, temporary residences, permanent affordable housing. They shelter the homeless. How about caring for the sick? The Franciscan Alliance of Hospitals all across the Midwest donate hundreds of millions of dollars in charitable health care every year. The Catholic Diocese of Rockville Center Prison Ministry in Long Island. They visit the imprisoned. How about burying the dead? The Catholic Cemeteries Association of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that exists in their literature to perform the corporal work of mercy of burying in the dead and has had to sue the Obama administration. So this is how the Obama administration is treating people of faith who are simply seeking to live out the calling of that faith and serving the least among us. How about its treatment of women? Wasn't this whole mandate imposed upon us in the name of women's health? There's such a stark difference between the two views of womanhood being presented in this debate over the HHS mandate. To illustrate this, I'd like to call attention to what strikes me as perhaps one of the most offensive ads of the political season, and that's saying something. <laughs> Have you all seen this Lena Dunham ad targeted at the youth? Lena Dunham, if you don't know, is an actress, a bit of a youth icon. She's creator of an HBO show called Girls. I haven't seen it, but I'm told it's kind of raunchy. Now, this is a family-friendly event here, so I won't describe this ad in detail. The ad, which is an official Obama for President campaign ad, it's on their website. Now, that should give us pause right here, if I can't describe the details of the ad in polite company. It's called the first time, meaning the first time voting. It's clearly aimed at 18-year-old girls voting for the first time, but very suggestive and full of all kinds of double entendre and innuendo. The closing line of this ad is that, and I'm quoting, it's super uncool to say, no, I just wasn't ready. Wow, super uncool for a girl to say no? Super uncool for a girl to say she's not ready? You know, I saw a picture just a few days ago in the newspaper of President Obama with his two beautiful teenage daughters. I think he had his arm around one of them in the picture. And I wondered, is this an ad he would show to his own daughters? Because that message is going out to all of our daughters. And I don't know about you, but this mother of three girls sure doesn't appreciate that message from the President of the United States. Now what's the tie-in here with the HHS mandate? A very underreported facet of this HHS mandate is that the free distribution of these products applies to teenagers too. So teenage girls under the President's health care law have access to free abortion-inducing drugs, even surgical sterilization, in many states without their parents' knowledge or consent. This divisive campaign ad is not only in bad taste, it's demeaning to the dignity of our girls. And, in the, and the President's health care mandate tramples on our parental rights to know about serious medications being given to our girls. Now let's contrast this very demeaning view of womanhood with the vision of authentic womanhood espoused by people of faith. We know that our fertility is a gift, not something to be manipulated by drugs that may be harmful to our bodies. I'm so proud to belong to a church whose beloved leader, Pope John Paul II, championed the dignity of, of women. He was a champion of what he called the feminine genius. 
So what's the response to be to all this for people of faith? Well, first, you couldn't have a stronger leader here in Philadelphia than Archbishop Chaput. What a gift he is. And our shepherds have displayed incredible courage in this battle. But they have asked us to join them and to lead in this fight. This spring, this past spring, when I read the bishop's little uh, pastoral letter on religious liberty on this issue, it, it's called Our First Most Cherished Freedom. I was so struck by the call to the laity to lead in this one little pastoral letter. It repeated the call no less than seven times, asking the laity to come forward to lead on this issue. So there's your answer to why we're not back at home in our warm family rooms with our feet up watching the ball game. And we can thank people like Patty Janusi for answering that call so generously and organizing this rally. And as people of faith, of course, our most important response to these threats is always prayer. So it's wonderful that this rally, last night's events, have been so centered on prayer. And I guess we're going to break in just a few minutes for the Angelus. Um, so in closing, we're in the final days of this campaign. And I want all of us to ask ourselves, what more can we do to educate people in the next few days? You guys are all here because you understand the threats to religious liberty. But so many people still don't get it. This is a relatively new issue. It can be complicated for people to understand. Some think it's just a debate about contraception. Or they're just too busy running between soccer practices and piano lessons. I can understand that. I have five kids. My three girls are here with me today. And of course, caring for those little sweethearts keeps me pretty darn busy. But we all need to ask ourselves, what more can we do? So I have with me today copies of voter guides that we produced at the Catholic Association. I have a lot of copies, and I would love to leave all of these. I would love to leave stacks in your hands to be distributed in the final days here in Pennsylvania. I think Patty's going to work on starting to pass those out. This voter guide shows us the stark difference between our two candidates for president. On the one side, we have listed Governor Romney's record on the issue of religious liberty. Very strong record. As governor, he, he sought to protect Catholic charities from being forced to place adopted children with same-sex couples. He vetoed legislation in Massachusetts that would have required Catholic hospitals to distribute abortion-inducing drugs, very similar to the HHS mandate. He's run campaign ads on this issue, uh, spoken. Congressman Paul Ryan couldn't be a more uh, strong ally in this battle. I hope you all check out the... Um, the campaign website where uh, Congressman Paul Ryan has a fabulous video on religious liberty. Governor Romney won several years ago before this was even a big issue. Won the Beckett Funds uh, very prestigious religious liberty award called the Canterbury Medal. So he has a long and strong record in defense of religious liberty. President Obama, on the other hand, as we've already described, has destroyed the long-standing bipartisan consensus on this issue. I'm going to call your attention to something at the bottom because it's something that might require a little more explanation. We reference the fact at the bottom of the voter guide that President Obama has re repeatedly replaced the words freedom of religion with the much more narrow expression freedom of worship. Just to repeat that, replacing the words freedom of religion with the words freedom of worship. Now you might just say, isn't that some small linguistic distinction? Some minor rhetorical shift? Well, sometimes these small distinctions make a big difference in real life. As Mark Twain used to say, it's like the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And the problem is this, that this rhetorical shift corresponds with a massive shift in public policy and real life implications that are changing the nature of religious liberty in this country. We began by talking about the First Amendment that was penned here in Philadelphia. Well, let's remind ourselves exactly what it says. It's etched in stone right behind us here. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion 
or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It does not say we have a right to worship. Just on Sundays, within the four walls of our little church, but rather the right to the free exercise of religion all week long, in the marketplace, in the public square. Again, how blessed we are today, out here in the public square, practicing our faith, about to say the Angelus. But it looks like we're going to have to fight pretty hard to keep it that way. Thank you and God bless, and please take a big stack of these to distribute over the next few days to your friends, neighbors, fellow parishioners. Thank you very much.